today's video is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. Now, judging by the fact that my channel is basically dedicated to discussing all kinds of mysteries, today's sponsor is really a natural fit for this channel, and that's Hunt a Killer, which is a subscription service that gives you everything you need to solve a new and interesting mystery every month. With each box, you'll go through piles of documents, evidence, audio recordings. You'll learn the details of a story, a crime, suspects, and the many complicated details that weave them together. And you can sort of think of it like a personal escape room delivered to your door. You can play with family, friends, or if you're like me and you're not the most sociable of the bunch, you can also play solo. And it's a good excuse to do something different besides scrolling endlessly on your phone each night. And with certain boxes as low as 25 bucks, it's a great deal for the amount of entertainment as opposed to spending money going out. And with part of the proceeds for every box going to the Cold Case Foundation, your fun you have playing Hunt a Killer will also contribute to solving real world cases as well. And so ultimately, you'll have a fun game night, it'll contribute to a good cause, and thanks to the folks over at Hunt a Killer, today you'll get an even better price. Just head to huntakiller.com slash sociable and use code sociable to save 20%. Once again, that's huntakiller.com slash sociable and use code sociable so they know I sent you. Thanks again to Huntakiller for sponsoring today's video. The year is 2003. A woman by the name of Lori Erica Kennedy had just met a man by the name of Blake Ruff at a Bible study in the eastern part of Texas. Shortly after, they hit it off, start dating, and that relationship would eventually lead to a marriage. While they were excited to take their relationship to the next level, when push came to shove, Lori made one thing clear. She did not want a wedding, or even an announcement in the paper, instead electing to quietly elope with only a pastor present. While this seemed a bit weird to Blake, it wasn't enough to stop him from proceeding. After all, Blake noticed that Lori was a secretive person, not willing to comment much on her past life, as well as often filling in the blanks vaguely in regards to her previous experiences. She had once told Blake that she had a rough childhood, burning all of her photos from that time. She claimed her father was a failed stockbroker and that she did not have any siblings. Blake, being a matter-of-fact and trusting person, seemed to take her at face value and presume nothing of it. However, as time would progress, Lori's secretive nature seemed to weigh on the relationship. After marriage, their immediate goal was to have a child, which after multiple attempts at having children, they had not been successful. While eventually Lori was ultimately able to have a child in vitro in 2008, Shortly after, it's reported that her mental state seemed to decay. She seemed to be incredibly overprotective of her daughter, not allowing her in-laws to even hold the baby. And despite her being incredibly secretive about her past, 
She would apparently go to great lengths to track down every detail regarding the Ruff's family, going as far as to research specific things like family recipes. But on the other hand, she took absolutely no interest in talking to the family at family gatherings. Eventually, Lori cut all contact between the child and her in-laws. Her inability to blend with her in-laws caused strain in the marriage, in conjunction with her secretive past, which ultimately caused Blake to file for divorce in 2010. Lori retained full custody of her daughter, and Blake moved back in with his family. Subsequently, during the months after her breakup, Lori's condition seemed to worsen. She began harassing the Ruffs, sending threatening emails, stalking them, and she stole a pair of their house keys. And a neighbor of Lori's had reported seeing her rambling to herself, pacing back and forth outside of her home. Reportedly, Lori's daughter looked thin. In an attempt to console Lori about the situation, Denny, a neighbor of hers, had offered to take her to church for counseling. And according to an article from the Seattle Times, it would state, she was frantic, about to the point of incoherence, he said. From that point on, I never saw her focus again. Denny suggested Lori come to counseling at the church where he served as a pastor. She brought in notebooks in which she rambled about, quote, what was wrong with her and how she could get him back, he said. As Lori sat out to talk, Denny couldn't help but notice her hands. They were, quote, the longest hands I'd ever seen on a person, he said. And they were always moving. She'd fidget with her hair or hold her hand out and gaze at it. Then she'd turn it over, gaze some more, and finally put it back in her lap. Her hands were important to her for some reason, he said. Lori spoke in circles, covering the same ground over and over. She'd say, quote, this is what's going on with Blake and me. And the next sentence was, quote, this is what's going on with Blake and me. It would go on like that for an hour. When she had a particular thought, her mind was stuck on it, he said to him. To him, it seemed like an obsessive compulsive disorder. Blake said he remembered her taking medication for ADHD or Tourette syndrome. Blake came in for counseling sessions too and brought along his brother, David. It was strange, Denny said. David did most of the talking as if he was translating for Blake. In the end, the counseling could not repair the marriage. This entire situation came to a head on December 24th, 2010. Lori had reportedly taken the drive on Christmas Eve morning from her home in Leonard, Texas. She had traveled a whole 125 miles to the Ruff's home in Longview, Texas. When Blake's father had opened the garage that morning, he reportedly found her car idling, where she had apparently passed away as a result of her own doing. The cause of death was an apparent single self-inflicted shot. From here, they found two notes, an 11-page one to her husband, and one for her daughter, for her to open when she turned 18. The police opened both notes, and while they have never been released publicly, they noted that they were clearly from someone who was mentally disturbed. Hereafter, the family apparently wanted to know more about Lori's past, and after her funeral, the family would take a trip to Lori's home, and they found the contents of her entire house in disarray. Papers were scattered, trash was stacked, laundry was thrown out, countless dirty dishes remained, and hidden inside her house was a single lockbox. After the lockbox was eventually pried open with tools, it would reveal various documents pertaining to Lori's past. As it would turn out, she had gone under multiple different names, and inside the box was the birth certificate of one Becky Sue Turner, a two-year-old infant who had passed away in a house fire. They found various scribblings on her notes, such as things like 402 months, which was believed to be the length of a possible jail sentence. They found the contact information for a disbarred attorney by the name of Ben Perkins in California. He said he had no memory of ever meeting Lori. As they sift further, they found a letter of recommendation from one Roger Steinbeck, printed on stationery from a five-star hotel in Thailand. This letter of recommendation was completely fabricated. Now, the family quickly sought help from various individuals, including one individual from the Social Security Administration. Nearly every lead was a dead end, however, but they did figure out a couple of things. Investigators learned that Lori had requested a copy of the birth certificate of Becky Sue Turner in 1988, and that same year, it was used to obtain a state ID in Idaho. Three weeks after that, Becky Sue Turner appeared before a judge in Dallas and had her name legally changed to Lori Erica Kennedy. After changing her name, she then applied for her social security card. 
Subsequently, she'd then get her GED and go on to college until she'd file for bankruptcy and then graduate. Someone who knew her around these years had claimed that she had worked as an exotic dancer to pay for college. She had apparently graduated the University of Texas with a degree in business administration. And now, as stated previously, investigators had hit a dead end at every turn. And in an attempt to aid the investigation, the Social Security Administration had worked with the Seattle Times to publish a story to get help from the public. The story was republished again and again until some breakthrough could be made. And while Lori's story became an online sensation among mystery aficionados, over this time, many theories ranged far and wide. Was she a spy? Was she someone who had done something terrible? Or was she running from someone? It wouldn't be until 2016 that we would get an answer. That's when Colleen Fitzpatrick, a nuclear physicist turned a forensic genealogist, would read an article about Lori's mystery in the Seattle Times and reached out to her family to help piece the puzzle together. Even though they did not have access to Lori's DNA at the time, they had the next best thing, Lori's daughter's DNA. Colleen submitted Lori's daughter's DNA sample to 23andMe and conducted a genealogical family search. The website's results stated that a man by the name of Michael Cassidy was probably Lori's first cousin. Colleen reached out to Michael through 23andMe.com's messaging service, but he never replied. Years later, another close match was made on Lori's DNA that also connected to Michael Cassidy. After spending months building a family tree of the Cassidys, she speculated that Lori's mother was one of Michael Cassidy's aunts. This revealed the true identity of Lori Erica Roff. Her real name was Kimberly McLean, and shortly after, her mother would take a DNA test to confirm. But it's worth pointing out that after this occurred, she declined to comment about the reason that Kimberly had left. Kimberly's uncle was willing to talk a bit more though, and he stated, that between the homemade family dinners each night and vacations, that she had a relatively normal suburban childhood. Though by the time her parents divorced in 1986, Kimberly's mother remarried shortly after, where she went on to live with her new stepdad in a different town in Pennsylvania. This is reportedly when the troubles started to happen with Kimberly. Within a year, apparently, she couldn't adjust to the new house and school. And close to her 18th birthday, she had simply left and told her parents to not look for her and ensured them that they would never find her as a result of her changing her name twice. Now, it's worth considering that this story about her leaving home in 1986 is just what the uncle had to say from his point of view. And while this case was technically solved, it's still incredibly difficult to say exactly what motivated her to change her name. Keep in mind, it was two years after Kimberly ran away that she would actually get the name of Becky Sue Turner. Furthermore, naturally, you have to ask, how does a 18-year-old girl leave home and suddenly have expertise on how to dodge the guise of Big Brother, not showing up in any kind of database, leaving no paper trail, and not to mention the implications of requiring resources to travel the United States to put this new identity into play? I think it's safe to say that we're missing some crucial details about this story. This begs the question, was Lori acting alone? Did she run off with someone? That remains unclear. It's hard to get a full picture of what went on without any kind of evidence. Beyond stealing an identity, Lori doesn't appear to have committed any serious crimes aside from that. The theories have ranged far and wide about Lori slash Kimberly. During that two year period, had she committed some heinous crime under another identity? Or was it possible that she was running away from someone or something that she was frightened of? If you recall, Lori was adamant of no public announcement being made about her marriage, meaning that her changing her last name would have fallen just slightly farther under the radar. I think it may also be worth considering if the story we were being told by the press is actually the truth, or if the Ruff family was actually being truthful about the actual reasons for the breakup. Because one very interesting detail seriously begs that question. On the other hand, what nobody seems to have pointed out is that there are some inconsistencies. According to the Freedom of Information Act request papers pertaining to this social security investigation, they appear to have caught the Seattle Times author in a lie. And I want to remind you that the Seattle Times was essentially doing this story for the social security investigation. Longview Police Department believed that Jane Doe was prepared to harm her in-laws, but when she discovered that they were not home, she took her own life. 
Assuming that the Ruffs were not home on Christmas Eve morning, the entire timeline of events that we're given in this Seattle Times article is completely off. Additionally, when this was brought up to the author of the Seattle Times article, who has definitely seen the police report, they would flat out deny this particular detail. But I digress. Because while Lori's case is interesting, it's actually not unique. And while there was some speculation with the original Seattle Times article that Kimberly may have solicited the services of an identity broker, it's only until you look at other stories similar to this one that you start to notice a trend. July 30th, 2002. 65-year-old Joseph Newton Chandler had been found dead by suicide in the bathroom of his tiny apartment. His body wasn't found for over a week, and by which point it was so badly decomposed, police were unable to obtain fingerprints, and they could not find any kind of fingerprint on anything else in his house. Three months before he had passed away, Chandler had purchased a firearm at a nearby store. He had also just been recently diagnosed with colon cancer perhaps choosing to go on his own terms, but $82,000 was left in Chandler's bank account. He did not leave any kind of will. Checking through the emergency contact to find any kind of kin, it led to his sister, Mary, but the emergency contact led to an address that was an empty parking lot. Investigators had searched for Chandler's next of kin and soon discovered that the man wasn't who he claimed to be. And it's also worth noting that Chandler had kept a packed suitcase seeming to indicate that he was ready to go at a moment's notice. He had stolen the identity of an eight-year-old boy who had passed away in a car crash on Christmas Day in 1945. In a similar turn of events, the story would make it out to the press and internet sleuths would theorize about who Chandler really was. But in spite of this, the case went cold for over a decade. By 2014, when US Marshals took over the case, they learned that Chandler had undergone a medical procedure in the year 2000. And at the hospital, they apparently still had his tissue sample. This DNA was compared against modern databases. And in a similar turn of events, they then contacted Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick, the same forensic genealogist from earlier. As a result of the forensic investigation, they were able to make a breakthrough. Joseph Chandler's original identity was Robert Nichols. And after interviewing his son, authorities were able to get some insight into his past life. Nichols, born in 1926, made his true age at the time of passing 76 years old. Nichols was also a veteran who served in World War II. He received a Purple Heart, but after returning home from the war, he moved on to a normal civilian life. He was married with three children. While settling down, he got a job at General Electric as a draftsman, but in a rather bizarre turn of events, he would randomly leave his family one day without much explanation, stating that, quote, in due time, you'll find out why. This led to a divorce shortly after, and Nichols leaving their home in New Albany, Indiana, to head to Dearborn, Michigan, to also work as a draftsman. He would subsequently get laid off, and on March 9th, 1965, Nichols would send a postcard to his parents from Stroud, Oklahoma, claiming that he was heading west. On March 20th, 1965, he would send another letter from Richmond, California, near San Fran, stating, please don't worry about me. I'm well and happy, I will write as often as I possibly can to let you know how I'm doing. And his last ever communication was with his eldest son. But it wasn't any kind of letter, and instead he had just sent him a penny with no context. And in this final postcard, it came from Napa, California. And after this final cryptic message from him, the family would never hear from him again, and he was reported as a missing person. It wouldn't be until 13 years later in 1978 that Nichols assumed the identity of the already dead Joseph Newton Chandler III. After gaining a copy of the child's birth certificate, he secured a social security card, he applied for credit, and within the next 24 years, like a chameleon, blended harmoniously in society as a Joseph Newton Chandler, electing to quietly hide away in Eastlake, Ohio. From the outside, Chandler seemed to live a quiet life from his one-bedroom apartment. Inside were homemade gadgets he built, get-rich QuickBooks, and a calendar where it was found that he had crossed out the days until he passed away. 
He worked as an engineer at Lubrizol, where co-workers stated that Chandler's behavior could be at times interesting. He occasionally told a few co-workers that he was worried about some people that were after him, stating that someone was, quote, getting close, but he never cared to elaborate further. According to his medical report in 1989, Chandler had gone to the hospital with a life-threatening injury, and he had claimed that he had gotten injured from being a bit too intimate with his vacuum cleaner. And it had apparently resulted in severe lacerations. Another coworker recalls that he once drove all the way to an LL Bean store 700 miles away, only to return home after there were, quote, no parking spots. He would apparently listen to TV static for hours on end. He apparently went to an office Halloween party dressed as Al Capone and then sat in the corner and smoked to no one the entire night. On the surface, outside of this strange behavior, Nichols' life was as boring as you could expect it to be. But as these other details come to life, you have to ask, why would he change his identity? He clearly had something to hide. Was he a fugitive? Was he just paranoid? Or was he running away from illegal trouble or unpayable debts? There must have been some reason he never contacted his family again. One can only speculate. It's also worth considering the fact that there is a massive gap between the time that he goes missing and the time that he assumes his identity. Given the fact that he did nothing for 17 years, you have to assume he would have left some paper trail somehow, meaning it may have been possible that he not only switched his name once, but possibly twice or even three times. Given this ability to elude a big brother, we only know where he started and ended. And just like in the case of Kimberly McLean, we still don't fully understand why. Now, if there's something I should clarify, it's that while Kimberly and Robert's cases are particularly mysterious, they are far from unique. A similar situation took place with a man by the name of Dylan Riebling in 2002, when a friend of his had passed away as the result of a heart attack. The man had stolen the identity of a child who died in 1973, once again a very similar situation. In this particular case, the guy had lived out the rest of his life just a couple of hours away from his family. In February of 2013, a revelation came forth when it was reported that Britain's police force had stole the identities of some 80 deceased children and issued fake passports in their name for undercover operations. Another man by the name of John Vincent had escaped a halfway house in Texas in 1986. Then he had been caught impersonating a dead child's identity for over 20 years. He had raised two kids under that name, got married twice, and proceeded to live his life as normal until he got caught. Now, whenever there's a discussion on this type of case, what often gets overlooked is the method in which these two people had it used in order to live under a new name. And while I'm sure many of you are more familiar with traditional identity theft, such as stealing a credit card for fraudulent purchases, in these two particular cases, it's a type of identity theft called ghosting. This is what you would call literal identity theft, where the goal is to steal an identity long term, where you're actually trying to live under that stolen identity. And to put it frankly, I want to say that this video is obviously for educational purposes only. I in no way condone you breaking the law. Moreover, I should say that this method used by Lori and Chandler in the modern day is completely outdated. And for those people that have managed to fly under the radar in the past couple decades, it largely stems from them stealing identities decades ago. On top of that, as governments have gotten better at record keeping, moving over from paper to digital, this isn't something that will likely ever be the same again. But to continue on into the specifics behind this particular method, as it used to be, it largely originates from one particular source, a source that has a lot of untold history. Now, the book that I'm speaking of came from a company by the name of Eden Press, a controversial publication that essentially taught people guides on various skeevy subjects. So you had things like classic mail frauds, how to beat the bill collector, and the most popular title is what this video is really all about. Published in 1970, The Paper Trip was an obscure and short book sold in local counterculture newspapers and eventually other newspapers. It outlined one very particular instance in which someone could quite literally trip up Big Brother and steal a full identity with ease. It involved people acquiring a real birth certificate in a dead child's name, 
and using it as the breeder document, which then could obtain a social security card, a driver's license, credit cards, and create a new identity. And if there's something we've seen from the cases like Lori Ruff and Mr. Chandler, it's that they ended up doing just that. If you recall, they could not get any usable prints off of Chandler. Now, normally you might not think much of this, but if you've read the paper trip and you know what he's referring to, there's a specific section on avoiding getting fingerprinted. And in particular, it talks about getting your fingers grafted in a medical procedure, or alternatively, burning your fingers with acid. And in regards to Lori, aside from the ID, if you recall, she faked those letters of recommendation, which is also recommended in some of those books. And if you recall the fact that Chandler had a packed bag, that is also another bit of advice that comes from the paper trip, as they discuss moving on to the next identity at any given moment. And it's safe to say that if they were practicing all of these things on a regular basis for their primary identity, they were probably doing a whole list of other things for their other identities. And it was reported in 1983 that some 75,000 individuals had avoided arrests using these particular guidebooks. And if you really stop to think about this for a moment, this one book influenced a lot of people's ways of living. While it was initially released as a way of dodging the draft, it's safe to say that many people may still be living under an identity that they forged from one of these methods. With that being said, it really makes you wonder if everyone you meet is really who they say they are. But that being said, I'm barely sociable, and have a good night.